Hey, all right, thank you all for being here this afternoon. I'm so grateful to see so many uh, students that I, I haven't seen already in 2020. So it's great to see all of you, and I wish you a happy belated new year. You're here because this is the, um, this is the second installment of the year-long series the German Law Journal is hosting to mark our 20th anniversary. And uh, almost half of its lifetime has been spent um, in residence here at Washington and Lee University, where it's supported by, um, by so many of the students I see here today as student editors. So I'm really grateful to um, have a chance to recognize the German Law Journal's role in our community and, and their hard work. Um, we, we themed this series this year something like uh, German law, past, present, and future. And I want to already look ahead to the future, future which is um, to say that we're going to have that presentation, German Law Future, at a, a panel discussion in, um, in April, April 1st and 2nd. So you'll hear about that, and I'll urge folks to turn out for that project. I don't want to get too far ahead of us, because we're supposed to be doing German Law Present today. <laughs> so um, keep that in mind for the future. But um, today, we're lucky to uh, have this lecture um, from Professor Haupt. On, uh, on the theme of, of online speech regulation, but uh, with a view towards its role and impact um, on German law and what it says about, about the, the state of affairs um, there as well. Before I, I make a proper introduction of Professor Haupt, I want to say a couple of words about the German Law Journal. Um, and it's, it's my journal, so I'm going to do, take the privilege of doing that. <laughs> You're stuck and have to, have to listen to this. If you don't know this already, listen, the German Law Journal is, can I say the, a leading forum, the, the leading forum for uh, scholarship on, uh, on the law from a transnational perspective. And I, I would even say transnational or transcultural perspectives on the law. Um, it also is respected and renowned for the fact that it pioneered open access um, scholarship in, in especially the, the legal scholarly space. And that has, is emerging now as sort of the dominant model. So long before um, the requirements of the European Union that European scholars begin to move their research to an open access platform, the German Law Journal has been doing this um, from the beginning. As I said, the journal has been based here for 10 years. And um, it's assisted by student editors here, but it's also um, managed and, and uh, assisted by a group of professional peer editors that are located around, around the world. Um, I want to tell you that it's a huge success and a profound project. How can I convince you of that? <laughs> What's the, I've got data. Should I try, should I try numbers? Try okay, numbers. so let's try that. Um, I can't think of a more persuasive source for this claim than, than Google. Right? So if you just Google best law journal ever, you get no. If, if you resort to um, something like the Google Scholar Impact Factor rankings, which traces citations to scholarship across a broad range of disciplines around the world in this, this platform that is and claims rightfully to be universal, it turns out that the German Law Journal is the, the world's third ranked journal covering European law. And it's bested only by um, the European Law Journal, with a title like that, shouldn't it be first, <laughs> in this discipline, and also the Common Market Law Review. And I emphasize that because people involved in this, this field understand that the Common Market Law Review is the flagship gold standard in, um, in that discipline. Um, and you know that because it's so old. Listen, it, it doesn't even call itself European Union law. It calls itself common market law review, as if we're still in the, the <coughs> 50s, which is when that journal had its origins. Um, I don't want to neglect, I see a couple of our, our esteemed and cherished librarian colleagues here, but I don't want to neglect the other major source for assessing whether a journal is, uh, has some integrity and credibility. And forget Google, right? It's really the Washington and Lee Law Library's journal ranking <laughs> regime. And um, I'm happy to say that they actually got it right. According to the W&L journal ranking regime, the German Law Journal is the number one journal. And I don't think we've cooked this, this result 
or at least we shouldn't admit this. All right. Um, <laughs> that would be one way of measuring the German Law Journal's success. I'd, I'd prefer to talk about the integrity and the quality and the significance of the content that it publishes, but it's 20 years of glory, so I can't, I can't, I've got to give the, yield the floor at some point. Just go online and take a look at the last issue, which gathers, and I'm, I'm not exaggerating, the most important commentators on European Union law today in a special issue devoted to the 20 challenges facing the European Union and European Union law in the 2020s. It's a, it's a magisterial project and it's typical of what the German Law Journal does. Here would be, here would be the best measure of its success. It continues to attract WNL's really fine students to, as I've said, um, contribute to its management and production. And um, I'm so grateful to the two Megans. I say the Megans because they're a force of nature, but um, Prieto and Megan Williams um, are leading that team of student editors here who do really important work on, on editing and managing um, this project. Um, serving this German law journal in that capacity has led some of its alumni to circuit court clerkships, to state Supreme Court clerkships, serving as in-house counsel for companies in Germany and the United States, to law firms and public interest positions. Um, so come join us and all of that awaits you and, um, and your work. The other way I could, I could say this with confidence is that it attracts really remarkable peer professional editors to the, um, to the editorial board, and that allows me to loop back to um, our guest today, Professor Haupt from Northeastern University's School of Law is a member of the German Law Journal's um, editorial board. Uh, where she and, and others help curate and facilitate the content that the journal publishes. Um, Professor Haupt trained um, in Germany, maybe that shouldn't surprise us with that long setup and her relationship to the German Law Journal, um, in Cologne where she uh, did her basic training in, in German law and then um, did a PhD in political science which is not typical to pair those fields in a positivistic and formalistic regime yeah. like Germany. So she escaped Sorry. that universe to come to the United States and, um, and just couldn't stop studying. So she did an <laughs> LLM at George Washington University, yeah. did a second PhD at the Columbia Law School, um, and then did a number of research and te teaching posts at, <laughs> both at Georgetown, um, at uh, Columbia, and at Yale as well. Um, she has wide-ranging research interests. She convinced me over three coffees that they're all perfectly interrelated. Perfectly related. And they will culminate in this remarkable lecture here today on um, the regulation of online speech, which um, uh, in the run-up to a presidential election uh, and uh, anyone reflecting on the, the health and fate of our, of our democracies today understands boy, what you have to solve today, Claudia. It's, it's tough work. All right, I'll but see anyway, what I can please do. join me in welcoming <laughs> um, Professor Haupt to you. Thank you. Thank so you. All right. Um, yeah, thank you for that, for that great introduction, um, Professor Miller. And um, uh, I want to thank the, the German Law Journal and um, uh, also the, the uh, Bosch Foundation Alumni Association. Um, I want to thank... Um, the, the two Megans and the, the wonderful uh, uh, student editors here at, uh, at Washington. It's, it's a great pleasure to be on the, on the editorial board of the, of the German Law Journal, the number one yeah, uh, exactly. journal, exactly. We're just gonna go with that. Um, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here in, um, in Lexington today. Um, so I wanna talk about online speech regulation in constitutional context. Um, and even though this is, this is going to be mainly about German law present, um, I will add two angles. One, a tiny bit about German law future, um, and a little bit about just a comparative perspective um, to kind of loop this back into um, the way that American um, legal scholars, um, commentators, or the larger uh, discourse has received um, developments in Germany in particular, and then in Europe more general. Um, 
So first I want to say a little bit about current German efforts to regulate speech online. And then I want to turn briefly to some comparative observations. And I hope that we can have a robust discussion afterwards um, and go a bit more into detail and further explore some of these themes because they're actually quite controversial, um, especially in transatlantic perspective. Um, so to set up this controversy, I want to do the comparative part so that you know you you feel like there's there's something to um, you know two things to um, to grab onto. Um, so let me start with the German perspective, and there. Um, I'm going to start with these current efforts to regulate online speech and focus on um, NetzDG. And you've probably heard about NetzDG, right? It's the Netzwerk Durchsetzungsgesetz, or the full title is Gesetz zur Verbesserung der Rechtsdurchsetzung in den sozialen Netzwerken. Um, of course, Netzwerk Durchsetzungsgesetz, one word, is the short title. Um, so the law was adopted by the German federal legislature, the Bundestag, um, in 2017, and it fully entered into, f into effect um, January 1st, 2018. And the aim of the law is to better enforce existing provisions of the criminal code in the online space. And I want to stop here and actually just repeat that, because this is the first thing that frequently gets sort of misunderstood, overlooked, misrepresented, especially in press reports about this law, right, where it says, well, Germany prohibits more speech. Actually, um, as I said, this seeks to adopt or apply existing provisions of the criminal code um, and, and apply it to the online context. Now, among these provisions of the, of, the, uh, of the criminal code that are expressly enumerated in NetsGG are dissemination of propaganda materials of unconstitutional organizations, using symbols of unconstitutional organizations, um, incitement to hatred, dissemination of depictions of violence, uh, and defamation. There are more, but those are the ones that I want to focus on. Um, NetsDG also creates reporting requirements for platforms um, that receive more than 100 complaints of unlawful, um, unlawful postings per calendar year. Um, it establishes a process for handling complaints about unlawful postings, unlawful content, so it requires platforms to delete obviously illegal content within 24 hours and other illegal content, so not obviously illegal content, um, within seven days. And then, of course, it contains provisions on regulatory fines. Now, from its drafting, NetsDG has been quite controversial. Um, but I think in order to fully understand sort of the controversial aspects uh, from a German constitutional law perspective, um, let's review the constitutional context, right? So this is going to be a quick review uh, of Article 5 of the Basic Law. So Article 5.1, um, as you will probably have heard, protects freedom of, of uh, expression, subject to a limitations clause in Article 5, Section 2. Um, and, you know, this is just to point out in comparative perspective, that's the classic setup of continental European or, you know, newer, later generation constitutions that there is an explicit limitations clause provided. So just... For a remind, quick reminder, Article, one, uh, Article 5, Section 1 says every person shall have the right to freely express and disseminate his opinion in um, speech writing and pictures to inform himself um, from generally accessible sources. And it says something about freedom of the press and freedom of rec reporting um, by means of broadcasting. And it says there shall be no censorship. I'll return to the censorship part in a second. Um, and then Article 5, Section 2 says these rights shall find their limits, right? This is the limitations clause in the provisions of the general laws. I'll return to that in a second as well. Provisions for the protection of young persons and the right to personal honor. Okay, so that's our quick review of the text. And then there's, of course, a long line of cases dating back to the early years of the basic law um, in which the federal constitutional court has expounded on both the importance um, of free speech and the limits imposed um, including by criminal prohibitions of hate speech, defamation, incitement to hatred. Um, and actually, the federal constitutional court has a very broad definition of what is encomp encompassed by freedom of expression, right? So it doesn't distinguish by subject matter. Um, it doesn't matter if an opinion has a factual basis, right? Opinion has a factual basis. It doesn't ascribe a value to expressions of opinions. There's a presumption in favor of free speech, especially if it's a contribution to public discourse. Um, on a matter of public concern. And the federal constitutional court has articulated that 
protecting the expression of, of opinions in public discourse is constitutive of a free democratic society. Um, I've actually written a bit about kind of the back and forth between various German courts um, on the scope of democratic public discourse. And the federal constitutional court is actually quite speech protective, even in relation to other German courts. So they're really sort of at the, at the forefront of you know, speech protection um, within the German framework. Um, now the leading text on the constitutional jurisprudence of the Federal Republic of Germany uh, concludes on the role of Article 5 uh, this way. This is a quote, when, when viewed comparatively, the German court's record in defense of freedom of speech, particularly in recent years, easily rivals that of the world's most advanced constitutional democracies. Um, now I also want to touch briefly on the concept known as Drittwirkung, just um, to flag that as well. So to a certain limited extent, constitutional rights can actually bind private parties in their interactions under this, under this doctrine. Um, the prevailing view was articulated by the Federal Constitutional Court. Um, you may have heard of the Lut decision that was sort of at the, at the basis of this. Um, is, so the view is that the fundamental rights, and in that case, it happened to be freedom of expression, actually reach into private law. Um, though there's some debate as to its extent, the fundamental rights are interpreted to have indirect third party applicability. And this concept is important in the online speech world um, because of the relationship among users, platforms, and the state, right? So at the core of it, it's really the relationship, the direct relationship between um, the user and the platform. So this is two private parties um, that are at the center. Okay, so that concludes our brief tour of Article 5, so back to NetsDG. So as I mentioned earlier, from its beginning, really, from its drafting, it's been, it's been quite controversial. Um, and indeed, in Germany, the law, the law is, you know, is in effect, but it's still being hotly debated. Um, so I wanted to just list a few of the criticisms and kind of just provide a bit of commentary around them to kind of give you a sense of sort of what the problems are from an internal perspective um, before I turn to the comparative view where you will see that the critiques that are sort of thrown at this law from the receiving end, so from, from outside of Germany, are not the ones that are considered problematic from an internal view, right? And I think that that's, that's, that distinction is really important. So we're, we're in the German uh, constitutional context and these are the critiques that scholars are um, uh, articulating um, why they think that NetsDG might be problematic. I think the biggest problem that they see is over deterrence. So platforms, mentioned, remember I mentioned regulatory fines, right? They're, they're quite hefty actually. Um, so the concern is over deterrence. So platforms will want to avoid potential fines. So they're going to err on the side of deleting content. Right? And that's going to create a chilling effect. So some German scholars suggest that this is in violation of Article 5. Okay, so this is how this works. The most likely outcome of any complaint will be that the content is deleted. Right? And it's relatively unlikely that a user will challenge the, dele the deletion in court. Right? You see that your tweet is deleted or your Facebook posting is deleted. It's very unlikely that you're going to go to court over that one deletion. And so the argument is, that whereas the individual's interest in their concrete expression might be minimal, right? it's just one post on Facebook, it's just one tweet, um, there's an overwhelming societal interest in, the fr in free expression. Right? And so the deletion of, if the deletion of content is unwarranted, the problem is not that it's just the individual's expression that's curtailed, um, but that society loses a contribution to public discourse. This also means, likely, that speech would no longer reach the outer bounds of what's permissible, right? Imagine that the platform wants to make sure that they're not gonna be fined. They'll preemptively start deleting content if they think, well, this gets kind of up to the line of where it could be illegal and we don't know for sure and so we're just gonna delete. Um, but that in turn moves the line, right? So it narrows the scope of what's permissible speech online, risking that perfectly legal content will be swept up in the process. 
So one suggestion that the literature makes that is that the law should not just punish deleting too little content, right? But also incentivize that, or also ensure that deleting too much is not incentivized. And the way that it's written now, they're incentivizing deleting too much because they just want to stay away from the platforms, just want to stay away from that, from that regulatory fine by staying well clear of the line of what might be considered illegal content. But that, at, as the argument goes, um, NetsDG is, so all of that means that NetsDG is not properly understood as a general law in the sense of Article 5.2, right? Remember I said there's a limitations clause, so the general laws are a permissible limit on freedom of speech. But the argument is, well, this is not a general law in the, in the sense of, of Article 5.2. All right, well, why is that? Well, again, this is, this is pretty contested, but this is how the argument would go. So Article 5.2, the limitations clause, doesn't just mean it's enough that there is some law, right, some general law that's capable of limiting free speech, and then that's okay. Rather, the idea is that there's a reciprocal relationship between protecting speech and limiting speech, um, so between the limitations clause and the right itself. You'll see this talked about as interdependence doctrine or Wechselwirkung. Um, in other words, any law that limits free speech must take into account the constitutional importance of free speech itself, right? So you're limiting something that's really important. So if you're limiting the thing that's really important, you have to take into account that that thing is really important, okay? And that's where some see NetsDG as too limiting on free speech, right? This is going too far in limiting speech. Here's an interesting empirical observation. I haven't been able to uh, dig into the data myself yet, so I'm relying on reports that I've seen pop up in the scholarship. Um, it seems that, um, remember there's a reporting requirement, right? So these reports are now coming out. It seems like as an empirical matter, the reports submitted under the reporting requirement don't actually bear out this concern. Um, so, you know, what are we to make of that? You know, they say there's going to be over deterrence. That should be re reflected in the reporting. Um, there doesn't seem to be a quantifiable trace of over blocking or over deleting, um, according to the report submitted to date. That's interesting, but here's a new concern that's then sort of mentioned in the same sentence. The new concern is that other countries, particularly non-democratic regimes, are taking the existence of NetsDG as permission to enact similar measures to suppress speech. Well, that strikes me as a classic slippery slope, slope argument, right? That just moves the goalposts from this chilled speech in Germany to this is a bad precedent because even though it might not be chilling speech in Germany, it may set the stage for chilling speech elsewhere, um, which to me sounds like an entirely different set of concerns, right? Not unwarranted, not at all, right? I'm not suggesting that. Um, it's just not what we, what we were originally talking about in the German context. So again, interesting, um, interesting sort of development um, starting from a theoretical, theoretically coherent claim of over-deterrence um, that isn't borne out in the data that then uh, morphs into a claim about not Germany but other countries. All right, so back to the German context and further concerns about NetsDG. So that was over-deterrence. There's also a, a concern about private enforcement. So the state places excessive responsibility on private parties, particularly determining the illegality of content, and that's considered to be a problem. Um, an alternative that you would find is uh, to instead strengthen state law enforcement or federal law enforcement. Indeed, the suggestion is that direct, direct state action would be more speech protective. Now think about that, right? Direct state action prohibiting speech would be more speech protective. Presumably, you would get around this sort of over deterrence based on just being afraid of, of um, falling into this liability 
um, if you go directly to the state, they're more likely to get it right, maybe, right? So this, this seems plausible. Um, another alternative that's suggested to this private enforcement mechanism is um, to alert users who flag content as illegal to the possibilities of filing a criminal complaint um, or seeking an injunction. You could easily imagine this as a pop-up, right? Like I'm, I'm alerting Twitter or Facebook to illegal content and there's a pop-up that says, please contact your friendly local law enforcement about this. Um, note here though, that the point of critique is why should private companies rather than the state decide what's illegal content, right? The problem is not that there is such a thing as illegal content or even that the criminal code decides that there is such a thing as illegal content, right? That's not the problem. Um, I'll circle back to that in a second. So that's, that's private enforcement. Then there's another problem set, deletion of obviously illegal content within 24 hours. So aside from the practical problems of that, right, that's a pretty, that's a pretty narrow window, 24 hours. But some scholars have actually pointed out that that requirement conflicts with Article 14 of the e European e-commerce directive um, this is a provision about intermediary liability. And that requires that the provider, upon obtaining knowledge or awareness, that is a knowledge or awareness of illegality, um, they have to act expeditiously to remove or disable access to the information. So this acts expeditiously part arguably is incompatible with the static or fixed 24 hour requirement under Nets DG. If the content is not obviously legal, the platform has seven days to remove, but then we still have to decide what's obvious and what's not obvious. Okay, so those are, I think, the main concerns that have been voiced. So if you, if you read sort of coverage um, about the law in, in the German literature, those are the things you're most likely to find. Let me point out one thing that is generally not at issue, and I've already kind of alluded to that earlier, and that is the fact that there is a state interest in regulating speech, right? Especially right-wing extremism online, right? So even most critics of NetsDG very clearly acknowledge that the law has a mostly legitimate purpose. They emphasize that it's not particularly well done, but the interest um, in regulating speech is not the problem. I say mostly legitimate purpose because there's, a, there's kind of a wrinkle to that. There are some who claim that Contrary to how the law describes itself, right, its own purpose, the, the, and, and contrary to the legislative history, um, the argument is that it actually goes further than merely implementing provisions of the criminal code. If that assertion is true, um, this could actually exceed the legitimate purpose of implementing the existing criminal laws. It's just not clear to me that I'm t entirely convinced that that's what it does. Um, so I'm going to just take the law at its word, as it were, um, and treat it as a vehicle to implement existing criminal provisions. So the main point that I want to make in this, in this sort of overview is that certain forms of speech are deemed impermissible. Um, doing so is fundamentally compatible with Article 5. Um, the criticisms that are voiced are coming from a constitutional context where that is very well acknowledged. It's not the problem that we're regulating speech. It's not a problem that there is such a thing as a criminal prohibition on certain types of speech. It's how it's done in this particular law that's the problem. Before I move on to talk about the comparative perspective, this is where the future developments come in. So keep an eye on some future developments here. Um, one is there are currently plans by the Federal Justice Department to amend NetsDG and create further reporting requirements. And the idea here seems to be to alert federal law enforcement. Um, so this is the Bundeskriminalamt. When certain content is flagged by users um, and subsequently deleted, um, apparently this would not only apply for deletions under NetsDG um, of content that's illegal according to the criminal code, um, but also uh, content that's deleted because it violates community standards. So this is Twitter or Facebook or whatever community standards. So you can, you can imagine that in the case of Facebook, for example, this could potentially be a more significant amount of, of content. 
There are also current efforts by the German Broadcasting Authority, so this is the Rundfunkkommission, around what's called the Medienstaatsvertrag, and that's, a, that's an agreement among the states. Um, so thus far, platforms were not part of the broadcasting regulations. Um, so the effort is, this effort would be to bring video platforms, mainly YouTube um, and other media intermediaries, into this regulatory ambit. Um, it looks like the key components here will be um, uh, non-discrimination and transparency requirements. So that, that means disclosure of the, selec the selection and sorting criteria um, for content on those platforms. Note this is happening on the state level, right? So this is a commission of the lender, so it's a little bit more complex because what we have so far is there's only agreement among the, the governor, so the minister president, right? Um, but the draft still has to be uh, submitted to the individual state legislatures. Um, so those are some kind of construction sites in, those, in this area that, where you might see some, uh, um, some, some new developments. Okay, so that was the German part. Um, let's move on to the comparative observations. So German and, I haven't really talked about European, but European as well, German and European regulatory efforts are met with great skepticism in the United States. And as, it, as you can imagine, that skepticism um, takes many forms. The crudest version maybe is something like, well, speech regulation is bad, right? Or maybe um, uh, censorship is bad. And so here I want to add a quick comment about terminology, uh, and that is on censorship versus speech regulation. Um, so I want to suggest that the language of censorship is just not particularly helpful here. And that's because it implies that it's presumptively impermissible. Um, but not all speech regulation is unjustified, right? And so I don't think it's helpful. I didn't come up with this. Um, you'll find others who say this. So for example, if you look at Jack Balkan's article on old school, new school speech regulation, he would say the same thing. But I think it's especially important in this context um, uh, to point out because it's, this is particularly true where the constitutional um, uh, provisions for speech protection explicitly permit regulation, right? Um, so as, was the case, as I said is the case in most constitutions outside of the US and as I just mentioned in, in our quick review of, of Article 5. All right, so I'm a fan of speech regulation over censorship. So what's the source of some of the skepticism in the US? A good chunk of it, it seems to me, is primarily disagreement with the way that other countries have struck their constitutional balance uh, between speech protection and speech regulation, right? So throughout the 20th century, constitutional designers have contemplated the proper balance between speech protection and speech regulation, um, and the European post-war consensus, um, as reflected in national constitutional regimes, but also as reflected in supranational um, uh, frameworks um, is just markedly different from that in the United States, whereas German and European legislative efforts are occurring in a context um, where the constitutional balance has been struck in favor of permitting some forms of speech regulation, obviously, you know, primarily based on historical justifications. Um, those enacted and proposed laws are received in the United States in a context that is historically extremely speech permissive. But drawing out this old debate, right, over whether to regulate speech in the first place, I think is really unhelpful um, in assessing or designing new regu regulatory regimes for, for online speech. And they actually obscure deeper theoretical concerns that are raised by the nature of online as opposed to offline speech. Um, and by the way, this might be a, a particularly good moment um, to have a comparative dialogue um, as the uh, sort of unbridled optimism about unregulated uh, online speech in the United States has been sort of taking a bit of a hit lately. Um, so what do we do in order to have a, sort of a more fruitful comparative dialogue? So one hurdle, there are probably others, um, but let me just pick this one. One hurdle to having a, a more sort of productive comparative dialogue um, is that the US discourse surrounding online speech um, 
is really steeped in two traditions. One is the marketplace of ideas theory, and the other is a history of internet utopianism um, that resulted in a kind of free speech absolutism. Of course, both of those traditions you will find reflected elsewhere in First Amendment theory. This is not um, exclusively true for the online world. Um, but it strikes me in the, in the online context, it strikes me as particularly influential um, and from a comparative perspective, problematic. Of course, as a doctrinal matter, um, the First Amendment doesn't apply at all when platforms regulate speech, right? They're private companies. Um, and in fact, <clears throat> US companies have started moderating content on their platforms in ways that the First Amendment under, under current doctrine would not permit. Um, but the First Amendment and its values have deeply influenced um, discourse around online speech. There's actually some uh, really interesting uh, current scholarship outlining how lawyers and managers at the, at the leading US um, social media companies see free speech and their rhetoric is very strongly rooted in the First Amendment. Um, and it seems like they've completely bought into the marketplace of ideas theory. But the marketplace of ideas theory, right, is not the only First Amendment theory. And there are at least two other classic justifications of free speech. And when I say that, I mean sort of domestic, traditional First Amendment theory. Um, and the two, the two others are, one, autonomy interests of the speaker and listener. So we protect free speech because they're important um, uh, uh, from an autonomy of the speaker or the listener, or both, perspective. And the other one is the uh, theory of democratic self-government. Um, by the way, as a side note here, um, I'm not entirely convinced that I buy the argument of domestic First Amendment theorists that we need to pick one single overarching First Amendment theory. Um, I'm, I'm much more sympathetic to sort of um, going by context, um, depending on the speech at issue, you know, some justifications may fit better than others. So my domestic First Amendment work, I, I primarily write about, or you know, not primarily, but I've been thinking a lot about professional speech. So this is um, speech between a professional and a client for the purpose of giving professional advice. Um, and there, I think, autonomy interests of the speaker, but especially of the listener, right, the client or the patient, autonomy interests of the, of the listener are, are much better fit than the marketplace theory or the democratic self-government theory. But in the online speech context, I think democratic self-government strikes me as a really good fit. So one suggestion I would have for the domestic arena is to just think more carefully about the democratic self-government theory of the First Amendment. And we may actually start identifying, sort of from a normative standpoint, some shared underlying concerns. Um, now, in the recent past, we've seen increasing skepticism about the democ democracy enhancing uh, character of the internet in general. Um, and of social media platforms in particular. Um, nonetheless, I think a driving normative concern is that democratic values be reflected online. So from a democratic self-government perspective, we may want to rethink you know, what kinds of speech online might perhaps be out of bounds. Um, I'm looking at the clock and I will conclude. Um, so um, let me just quote, in, sort of starting this um, Jack Balkan again. So he says, the problems of free speech in any era are shaped by the communications technology available for people to use and the ways that people actually use that technology. So whether we're regulating the printing press or the internet, right, the regulatory framework must grapple um, with technological in innovation, but at the same time, um, free speech values are likely more enduring than the lifespan of any one of those technologies. Um, and so free speech values, however understood by supranational or national governments and, and citizens, will be expected uh, to equally apply online as well as offline. Um, and for those legal systems that have struck a balance in favor of hate speech regulation, for example, they'll likely seek such regulation be mirrored online as well. And this is as much a matter of constitutional doctrine as of constitutional culture um, and historical and political context. And so I suggest that any emergent theory of online speech regulation must take into account that for better or worse, 
it likely won't be the American understanding of free speech, which is an outlier in its protection of hate speech and other forms of expression that are impermissible elsewhere, um, that will govern, govern online speech around the world. But this comparative point um, is often lost in domestic discussions of online speech um, regulation, where a First Amendment baseline is commonly assumed. Um, and so I hope that I've been able to at least illuminate a few of those aspects by considering German laws present on, on this issue. Um, and I'll stop here and thank you for listening and I look forward to your questions. Do I get to call on people? Yeah, Excellent, this is just like teaching. Amazing, yes, please. Uh, first of all, Professor, thank you for coming and for giving us this uh, lecture. It's been very thank you. Uh, my question for you is, what role do you see artificial intelligence and uh, automated algorithms playing in online speech regulation? Yeah. And how do you view those, those technologies as compounded the constitutional issues that we see? So this is a really great question. Um, and it's really interesting because the more you see regulators and courts having to grapple with this question of content moderation, the more you see that um, they think that there might be a future in which um, problematic content can be picked up by AI. Um, AI just isn't there yet. And so you will see um, sort of as the solution to the problem, well, just you know, let the AI moderate Facebook or Twitter. Um, This is an over-reliance on technology and, and a, and a um, sort of optimistic view of what this technology can do. So the biggest problem with that, at least right now, is that they're really bad at picking up context. Um, so you can show, um, you can show, um, you know, say there's, a, say there's a community standard of no nudity on, on the platform. You can show them uh, you can show the, the, the algorithm uh, uh, a museum picture of, you know, name famous artist nude, and they're going to filter that, right? And that has nothing to do with what they were trying to get at um, in the uh, in the community stand in setting that community standard policy. So so the contextualization, the um, the sort of understanding of um, of memes, for example that's gonna be really hard to teach uh, an algorithm. And so right now, platforms are stuck with having to hire just tons of human content moderators. Um, they also have to be somewhat aware of local you know, traditions, um, ways, of ex you know, ways of expressing um, uh, different ideas, right? Um, so maybe at one point we're going to get to uh, a world where AI can actually help with the problem. Right now we're not there, so right now we have human content moderators. I think our best tech solutions right now are geo-blocking um, and delisting. Of course, if you have a VPN, geo-blocking is only get you so far. Right? If, um, if it's hard to tell where you are, um, the blocking mechanism won't do much. So there's a limited set of tech solutions. Um, this actually also gets into another really interesting uh, problem set that I haven't really touched on yet, and that is um, local versus global takedown. So um, your classic example is Thailand. Um, so they have... Um, you can't criticize the monarchy, basically. So if you have a geo-blocking type situation, that's fine for the local laws. Um, there was a, um, uh, a decision involving Facebook in Austria where they said, well, actually, we're going to, um, possibly they asked the European court if they could do that, and so now it's bounced back to Austria. But, um, they asked, you know, can we, or can we have a court order that says we want global delisting or global deletion of this content? And so that's where you're going to see the new kind of, um, kind of fault lines. Um, and there are some scholars doing really, um, really good work in that, in that area. Other questions? Yes. Uh, 
one of the Megans. <laughs> Um, I'm very curious about this obvious versus non-obvious illegal mm. content standard. Um, I think specifically regarding like non-obvious illegal content, if there's in practice a lot of challenge to that, and also was wondering if you could elaborate more on like what would fall within that realm of non-obviousness. Mm. Right. I mean, so if you post a swastika, that's probably going to be the obvious part. As soon as you get away from that, this is kind of what I, what I was saying with the memes, right? So that's when it gets really difficult. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, it'll be interesting, this, is, this will be a developing issue. Um, it will be really interesting to see how do we, how do we define the non-obviously illegal uh, standard. What does that do in terms of a criminal law, right? Is this vague? Is this, is this uh, um, you know, otherwise problematic? But, but yeah, I mean, that's really where, the, where the, the, the future challenges will come from, I think. Um, if I had to predict, it would be um, what's obvious and what's not. I mean, what's obvious, at least in the German context, you can rely on, you know, this this long line of of court cases, and we've and in in part this is um, where the offline world can inform the online world because for obviously illegal content, you can just go back to what what was. Um, considered um, illegal content in newspapers or in other contexts. Um, whether the non-obvious part gets somehow um, you know, diluted over time, we'll, we'll see, but this is, you've identified the construction site. Um, it'll be interesting to see what, what happens. Yep. You mentioned that with the potential overcorrection of yeah. websites blocking content, that an individual who posts something that they don't think is illegal can challenge that. And I'm wondering what the utility of that would be, because even if they got a judgment that it said it wasn't illegal, don't those platforms still have the private right to delete whatever they choose? So there's, an, there's another really interesting question. So to what extent do the community standards overlap with what uh, NetsDG and the criminal code consider to be illegal content. And what happens if it's not illegal content? So does NetsDG establish a floor or a ceiling for illegal content? That's also an unanswered question. I'm sorry I'm going to keep doing this because this is a new law, right? And we just haven't seen, we just haven't seen enough challenges for me to say this is how this works. But um, but that's exactly going to be one of the one of the questions. Is number one, what's the remedy? Is it relisting, right? And just think about it as a practical matter, right? You're sitting there, and say you're you know you're watching something on TV and you're providing commentary on Twitter, right? And you're like, well, whatever that candidate said in the presidential debate was totally stupid. And then you you know add some illegal content or you know presume like non-obviously illegal content. And so then it gets taken down, right? You challenge it, and what like, you know, it's, think about a court challenge. Say like five months later, it comes back up and it's like, oh, well what that candidate said is, you know, and the election is over, and so, right? Um, that's going to be a problem. Other Megan, other Megan? Yes. Good. Um, this is maybe more of a practical question, not so theoretical. But you mentioned human moderators and that yeah. this is private enforcement. You know, we spend three years of legal education and then the rest of our career trying to figure out and interpreting the law. Who are these human moderators? Are they lawyers who have been trained in deciding whether something is criminal activity, especially if it falls under non-obvious? And that could be a whole slew of things. Um, how are these human moderators trained in recognizing non-obvious criminal activity? Um, that, again... <laughs> is one of those questions, right? So there's going to be standards that are, that are written by the companies that are basically like, here's what we're looking for, here's what you can and cannot do. The interpretive aspect is still left to the, the moderator um, themselves. Um, look in the, in the current legal literature, there's, um, there's a bunch of people who are writing specifically on that. Um, who, are, who are the, and remember, um, uh, Zuckerberg was going to have the this like Facebook Supreme Court um, 
so all of those things work together in in you know in trying to to get at that. And there's um, uh, uh, there's some really interesting research done about how how they're picked, how those guidelines are implemented, um, and so um, uh, yeah, that, that, that's that is exactly one of the one of the big challenges. Happy to uh, happy to give literature recommendations after the uh, after this. This is, this is interesting. Oh yes. Hi. Yeah, I, I just wanted to ask how effective is this sort of regulation, particularly in regards to uh, states or areas outside of Germany's jurisdiction, yeah. as well as possibly private companies who do not want to comply with the regulation? Ah, yes. So two really interesting aspects to that. One is um, we actually don't know yet, I'm going to say yet, effective, uh, uh, optimistically, as if there's going to be a, an empirical answer anytime soon. We don't know what the sort of value add of NetsDG actually is, because remember I said those are provisions that are already in the criminal code. So absent this new reporting requirement that the, that's sort of being talked about right now, um, where local authorities, um, lo local law enforcement, or actually federal law enforcement authorities would actually be alerted um, to illegal content so that presumably they could start their investigations. We don't even know that there's, that there's any sort of extra um, that NetsDG provides because presumably for all of the delisting requests, you could have also contacted your local prosecutor and said, hey, there's illegal content there. So is it a thing that might make it easier, right? So say you alert the platform to illegal content, but they don't automatically alert the authorities. It gets delisted. Does that do anything? That you can also get at with community standards. Is it, and this is again the sort of floor ceiling question, is it do we get all of the stuff that's in NetsDG as like, we want to be speech protective and not go with your community standards, just go with our law? We want, to, we want you to go with the law and not the community standards, which is more. And what does that actually add um, in terms of going beyond what's already in the criminal code? The other aspect um, is there's a, this is the, this is the sort of transnational question. Um, there is a lot of pressure on US social media companies to comply with European regulatory regimes if they want to keep doing business in Europe and not get hit with all those fines. So what they've been doing is, this was the part where I said they're actually implementing um, community standards and, uh, and moderating content in a way that would not comply with US First Amendment doctrine, right? So what they're doing is they're taking at least some of the European regulatory uh, efforts and they're incorporating them into their community standards and so then they're going to start moderating more like a European model than like a First Amendment inspired American model around the world just to avoid um, just to avoid trouble elsewhere. So that's creating that's creating informal pressure on um, on US companies to behave in a way that normally U.S. companies wouldn't have to behave in in a purely domestic context. Hey, at the risk of, of chilling or even shutting down... Your, sh your, yeah, your say, censorship. Yeah, exactly. The, the time is run on, on this session, but I'm right. really happy to be able to say that we've got a, a luxurious reception booked just outside this door and to the right. <laughs> yeah. um, so please stop by and, and um, continue this conversation with Professor Haupt. And, and others. Uh, I, I was um, remiss to say at the beginning, thank you for mentioning it. Um, this is a German Law Journal program, but the, the funding for um, Professor Haupt's visit was provided by the uh, Robert Bosch um, Foundation Fellowship Program uh, Alumni Association. And so we're very grateful to them for sponsoring, uh, sponsoring today's event. They're deeply committed to transatlantic relations, and I think you can see why they were attracted to having um, Professor Haupt's uh, presentation today. Thank, Thank you. you all very much and please join us for um, for a continuation of this conversation. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.